is Hagar Kim Temple, and this just shows you the summer solstice sunrise alignment as it would go through the temple here. You can just see that's the red line, and it would go back there and light up a very small area, which we're going to go and have a look at shortly. Again, you can see here the cut marks, the very small cut marks with a double spiral and some kind of relief carving. It almost looks like a serpent's head, that, doesn't it? And then the sort of serpent body kind of goes into these spirals with these cut marks. So we find this even here at Hagar Kim um, on the southeast coast of Malta. So we're going to go into the temple now, check it out proper. So we're heading into Hagar Kim now. They've built a roof over it since I was here back in 2007 and several other times before that. So we're not going to get the light we kind of like, similar to what we uh, had to deal with at Gebekli Tepe, but it's preserving the site. Uh, it's supposed to be at least two and a half thousand BC, maybe older, but it's got some of the most impressive megaliths, especially the facade here and the whole of Malta and one of the most impressive megalithic sites in the world. So let's go in and take a look. You can see these extremely worn stones behind me, with some of them are about four or five meters tall. So, you know, that, the biggest one there looks like 25 feet. Um, so it's pretty massive. So you can see why they've covered it up. Um, these would have been on the facade, they've been badly weathered and so although the roof does kind of ruin the ambience of the place, you can't get good photos and film footage etc, it's actually protecting the site um, from further damage so at least, uh, at least it's going to last for a few more hundred if not thousands of years. But one of the things you notice with these, with these very ancient temples in Malta is an almost polygonal design stonework. They're very puffy looking stones. If they were pristine, they'd be much more puffy looking, all slotted together very neatly. And you can see the difference between the ones that are being protected and the ones that have been facing the elements. You can see how much weathering has destroyed them and battered them. It's really, really full on. So the first excavation or the first clearance of the site was 1839 by Colonel J.G. Vance. Then further excavations were carried out at the site between 1885 and 1954. And these were really the only visible stones sticking out of the ground because much of it was covered in earth at that time. So just inside the temple here at Hagar Kim, you can see, if you look carefully, the cut marks on the stones at the back there, just either side of the square stones in the middle. These are like the mini cut marks we saw at Gigantia and at other sites all around Malta. We saw them in the museum and Tarsian. And so these fascinate me because these are reminiscent of some kind of, you know, do they represent the sort of scaly skin of the snake? And the spirals represent the serpent energies or the serpent elite that built these sites in prehistory. It's fascinating because some of the stones here are huge. This is on par with Gigantia up in Gozo. And some of them must be like 50 to 80 tons a piece. So here we see like one that must be 30 feet tall, 25, 30 feet tall. And it's propped up actually on a base there. So these really are freestanding temples. They're not kind of buried. The base of the stones doesn't necessarily go right into the ground. Like we see a classic stone circle, such as Stonehenge and Avebury in England. So this limestone is very interesting because um, when it was actually in the ground, you get tight bits of water would be pushed through it. Mm -hmm. So you get these sort of holes in it and these strange um, channels. And there are suggestions that this, these were placed here on power spots uh, of natural telluric currents and underground water and earth energies. And the limestone would kind of harness the energy. And then they had other kinds of stone, different types of limestone and other things within the temple. And this is where the ceremonies would take place. Uh, and the serpent symbolism you see in the spirals. And you actually see actual serpents at Gigantia and other places. So there could be something in that for sure. So just over in the distance here is the other part of the temple, which is unfortunately out of bounds. But let's just zoom in to have a closer look. 
and you can kind of see again some very large stones making up the entrance the entrance walls on the left and right of the walls there and you can see the way they're placed again it's a freestanding temple and um, it's just a pity we can't go in there really because it, it looks absolutely fascinating but again it, uh, at least they're kind of protecting it from the, uh, the people not necessarily protecting that one from the elements by the looks of it but at least it's still here for us to witness today so we just spotted here a carved hole um, near one of the entrance this looks like some kind of altar but next to it is this carved hole here and this is very similar to not only what we saw at Gigantia but also this is what we find at Gebekli Tepe we find this um, oriented roughly to the north, or just off north, which potentially uh, points to the, the centre of the Milky Way. So this is the stone that officially weighs 20 tonnes, but clearly it looks much, much bigger. That's almost twice my height, four times my length, so we're looking at in excess of 50 to 80 tonnes at my estimate. Absolutely fascinating. And this is the main entrance here. You can see the beautiful way they've laid the stones. There's a lintel over the doorway. There's almost polygonal work up at the top here on the left. You can kind of see the way that's been curved round to accommodate that particular stone. And these have been laid really precisely and beautifully. It's quite a stunning piece of technology in itself. Very large stones on either side of me made of this beautiful white, whitish yellow limestone. And uh, it really has got an energy here. And I wonder if these symbols here may represent actually the energy itself. Now we're just coming to the main temple, the very first part of it, and just immediately you can see these huge great portal holes that make up part of the um, inner walls here. And these retaining blocks here Again, we're just looking outside the temple there. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely beautiful stonework. And here we have a carving of the, the double spiral, which we find all over Malta and Gozo, and also all around the world, and with strange small cut marks. Again, we do find another one of these portal stones on the other side of the temple. Just, in, just inside the entrance. And you can see the beautiful kind of window frame they've kind of carved around it. It does look very reminiscent to some of the um, discoveries at Gobekli Tepe, uh, admittedly. So that is uh, particularly interesting. And you can see just behind it is like a curved wall that goes around it. And like at Gigantia, we do find these hollows here, these very large cut marks just on the inner walls as though there was some kind of um, there's something going across and another one there. Okay, you just see the size of these stones that make up the lintels here, quite impressive. It must be like 20 odd tons at least. This is just a copy of the um, incredible kind of altar that was found here at Hagar Kim. You can see the cut marks, you can see the kind of almost ribs on it, the serpents potentially. So what this was used for is unknown, but the fact that it's just inside the main temple complex is absolutely fascinating in itself. Was it some kind of plant medicine ritual? Was it a sacrificial table where they would put the hearts of the animals on here? Did it have some more esoteric or even more practical meaning? So we're in the second part, second segment of Hagar Kim now. And again at the back there you can see what is called the Oracle Hole. But I believe this could be a representation of what we saw 
a, a, what we see at Gebekli Tepe, and it could be even an influence from Gebekli Tepe. And you can see a very similar stone construction uh, that we saw at Gebekli Tepe and at Gigantia up on Gozo. You can also see behind me here um, the way the roof kind of leans inward. It's like a corbelled roof, although the stones are much bigger than what we see at like Newgrange or other places where the roof corbels like that. But it does suggest the whole place had an amazing beehive roof on it. Uh, and this could be evident all over Malta and it, all the temples on Goza and Malta. So um, it's very interesting that, that that could have been part of the design spec. That, that could have even been what they were doing at Gebekli Tepe. So it's just fascinating that it would have been an incredible structure when it was complete, when it was the whole, the whole thing was here. Obviously a lot of it's tumbled down, it's been badly weathered, it's been damaged, probably the stones have been taken away to build the local towns and villages, but the fact that there was possibly a huge megalithic roof on here is um, quite an incredible idea. And then this is where the, you start seeing evidence of the corbelled roof which when it was first discovered, they actually found evidence of that. And it was that idea that was put forward by such archeologists as David Trump and others. So we're back in the second temple on the left-hand side. And we see more examples of these altars. This is also where four of the great goddess statues were discovered, apparently near the steps over in the background over there. And there would have been some kind of view out to that small island, which you may just be able to see in between the two stones at the end. I wonder if that was part of the tradition here, where it was like a sacred island, and they would actually align accordingly towards that. That would be an interesting place to visit. And I wonder if there's any artifacts that have been discovered on there. I wonder if that was part of a ritual that they would go out to the island um, and it was linked with this particular site here at Hagar Kim. In the outer western wall of the temple here, this particular stone is really interesting because it has some relief carvings of two goddesses, just the legs showing. And we know that the very well full-bodied goddesses we're talking about here, but this actual stone just manages to show that. It's obviously very weathered. And so this is particularly interesting. So there could have been goddess pictures here, like uh, high reliefs actually carved on these stones in a very similar style to probably what we find at Gebekli Tepe and other places like that around the world. Here's a beautiful image by F. Pasallo from 1886. And it shows you what it would have looked like on this eastern, pretty much eastern side. And you can see the large stone there with the, uh, with the oracle hole uh, connecting to the internal chambers, which uh, is kind of hidden now. And beside the niche there, there is a hole, but you can't quite see it. But this is kind of what it looks like now. So unfortunately, it's got this big roof on it, so you can't quite get a sense of the landscape, but at least it's gonna protect it. So there's some unusual stones here. There's some very rough hewn stones. There's some very quite nicely cut stones. There's the hole. There's the oracle hole where incantations and different uh, kind of oral histories were given. No doubt it was like uh, with the bards of Malta, if there were bards, would share their knowledge. And you can see these are the original stones. These are weathered, very weathered just through the high winds and rain over the millennia. You know, considering how old this site is, it's not as old as Gigantia, but we're looking at at least three and a half thousand to 4,000 BC. And now with the new dating, there's a suggestion that it actually could be much, much older, at least 700 years older than originally thought, although new evidence is emerging through archaeoastronomy that it could be almost as old as Gebekli Tepe, which is at least, almost 12,000 years old. What's also very interesting about uh, this particular site is the fact that down the um, edge of the island here, right next to where the temple is, is actually a fault line. So there's actually uh, an earthquake fault line that goes along the edge. So this would indicate that this site was chosen specifically because of that because it gives some kind of, um, not only will it kind of, you know, pick up the energies from the fault line, which could have been then harnessed 
It could have also produced earth lights, which could have been why they felt this was a sanctified sacred zone. But also, um, it does suggest that being next to the water, combined with the fault, um, and combined with the natural limestone and the energies you get with that, you know, this could have been a really powerful site. There could have been something really special about this site. And maybe all the sites were built on known faults. Um, and they were kind of sanctified areas, not just this, this temple here. I'm very impressed, to be honest with you. I mean, the roofs are a kind of a pity. They kind of ruin the aesthetics of it and the look and the photographs and things like that. But obviously they're doing it to protect it. There's a good agenda behind it. Um, and they keep them safe from any vandalism and things like this. The, but the megalithic work there is just something else. It's much more impressive than I remember um, when I came back here in 2007. Both sites are very close to a fault line. So to me, it does suggest that there's something quite significant here energetically. And they were built according to various temple principles using sacred geometry, uh, geodesy, the placement, orientation, aligned with the solstices and the equinoxes and various other factors but I think the fault line is the most interesting one because it brings an energy element into it and the fact that in the distance we have that small island a sort of flat topped island which again as they found Neolithic finds on there as well uh, so that could have been almost like a backside uh, to the orientation of the temples so overall amazing sites really worth a visit. of the site. Yeah. So this is the official guardian of Adivakan. Don't mess with the cat goddess.